Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. Guys, I'm back again. Um, I know I've been doing a lot of videos lately. And in today's case, I wasn't really going to do another one, but um, it's after midnight and I can't sleep, so I try. You know, the weird thing is, is every once in a while I get into a rhythm where I am sleeping at night, but for some reason, the sleep is less restful than when I sleep during the day. Like, when I sleep during the day, it's weird. I go into dreams and everything, you know, I get a deep sleep. Every once in a while, I'll sleep at night, but, you know, when I get up in the morning, it's like I, I still feel tired. So, I don't know. So, I ended up falling asleep at like 8 p.m., and I and I knew that was bad. And I slept for, I don't know, like an hour and a half or two hours or something. And uh, wide awake since then. So, I did try, again, to, to go to fall asleep, but it's not happening. So I thought I'd come out here and uh, maybe make up a little bit for the, um, with my new professional microphone setup. You see, this is the tip of the microphone right there. Um, and I actually had a, 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 one of these professional microphone stands, um, the tabletop kind. And uh, it's like, well, why don't I use it for something besides just uh, recording my music? Um, so... I'm like a professional broadcaster almost. Um, so to make up for the long, last last couple rambling videos I did. See, the only problem with this microphone here is it gets in the way when I'm showing things on the screen. I know I'm going to bump into it and make a very big noise that's going to kind of ruin the video. So I don't like having that big physical thing so much right in my face like this. Um, but I'll I'll make do because I think the I think um, by using this external microphone, going through my old hard drive recording system and the mixer there, I think the audio is a little better than on the um, or probably hopefully a lot better than when I just use the uh, camcorder microphone. So even though you can't hear the music unless I put it up really loud, oddly enough, well not oddly enough, that's the way the microphones are designed. Um, so I'm still working on that, and I can only put the music so loud because it is after midnight and I have neighbors upstairs up above me. Um, okay, so I'm going to do a vinyl pull because I haven't done that in a while. And by doing a vinyl pull, I can control the length of the video a little bit and keep it under the, the last two that have been like 40 and 45 minutes long. So um, I could I could talk and ramble some more. Um, but I think I've done a lot of that, you know, I've done like an hour and 25 minutes in my last two videos of just talking, just rambling and, and just about, uh, not about music really. So I'm just going to do a, I'm going to do a pull here. I thought I pulled this already. Um, here we go. Brian Eno's Ambient 4. On land. I remember that when this came out. It's interesting because I thought I pulled this earlier. I know I was talking about this album uh, recorded between 78 and 82. This is um, the fourth ambient album that Brian Eno made. Um, but this one, as opposed to the others, has much shorter pieces. Um, it's got four pieces per side. So there's no long tracks on there, and, and this is why it doesn't work for me. A lot of people really like this album, but there's a couple shortcomings to me, and one of them is the length of the pieces. There's no long pieces on here. And to me, uh, ambient music is kind of atmospheric music, the kind of music that you put on and you get lost to. You know, you kind of close your eyes and you imagine whatever images the, the music brings up. And the idea, I think, you know, is to get lost in the music. And when a track is five minutes long, you can't do that. Um, so, and, and there's also a couple other things. The other ambient, especially the first 
two that, that Brian Eno did. The, the third one was done by Laraji, which is a, a fine album. Um, but talking about the ones specifically that were created by Eno, uh, the first two, actually, I say the first three, including Discrete Music. Discrete Music was really the first ambient music album. Um, those all had longer tracks and like music for airports, uh, the tracks are like 10 minutes long each. Um, some, some of them a bit longer actually as well. And I think that's what you need to get into the music, but also discrete music and music for airports are built entirely on music and in terms of notes played by instruments. What I really don't dig so much about this album, besides the short tunes, is it's a lot of there's a lot of things that sound like sound effects in there to me. Uh, it's more about creating this thing that sounds weird at times than it is actual music. Uh, it's more about processing things that sound like, you know, like a, like a, a frog slowed down on tape kind of thing. Stuff I don't dig that. I don't dig um, I don't dig sound effects. I prefer when a musician uses instrumentation to suggest something and real instruments rather than you know tape recordings of rain or something like that. You know, give me an impression of um, an orchestra playing rain, a string section, uh, drums playing rain. How do you create that rather than just a recording of rain, which anybody can do and get, and it's probably already in there in your synthesizer anyway. So um, a lot of people really like this album. Um, and there's... Um, a few guest musicians on there like John Hassel, uh, Michael Brook, who plays a bit. Um, but, um, and it's not that there's anything wrong with their uh, contributions. Their contributions are actually musical because they're playing instruments. Um, but most of the music is coming from Eno himself. And to me, this one just, um, just doesn't work as well. Um, I, I did. I bought this on. Uh, I have this on CD as well, so it's not like I haven't listened to it, uh, you know, since the vinyl era. Um, but it just it, it falls short. It's definitely one of the lesser ones, even though it was the last one of the of the series for years. And when uh, Brian Eno started putting out uh, additional ambient music albums, he didn't really um, number them anymore at that point. Um, it's not horrible. I like it better than his rock albums still, uh, you know, his vocal albums. But, um, you know, there's, like I said, the, the pieces need to be longer and they need to be less gimmicky. I, I, just, you know, I just noticed the gimmicky the thing like uh, people uh, like, you know, who love to play every, probably a lot of musicians love to play in the studio and we like to get a sound down and not and maybe not necessarily an instrumental sound and um, see what you can do with processing and all that but you could play with all those kind of things and not be a musician um, and so I you know I don't know that album doesn't work so much for me so let me let me see you knew I would pick out an ECM album it's almost inevitable and I am, uh, I got a little bit of a gap in there, so I'm going to be filling it again with more albums. And I don't know if I should make a cut. What I do is um, I generally, I have a lot of albums in my bedroom on the, on the floor in stacks, not piled on top of each other, but standing up. Um, and a lot of those tend to be ECM, but not exclusively. And I've been refilling my supply from the bedroom, you know, out there, uh, in the in the vinyl selection pile here um, with those albums maybe I should consciously go more deeper into my stuff that's actually in bins that's not ECM to replenish what's what's back there so that you know I get I don't know I don't know it's just a thought here's an ECM recorded August 1977 which was um, for me, uh, an interesting time in my life because I had just graduated high school 
two months prior to that and um, had no idea what I was going to do. I wasn't set up to go to college or anything. So um, it was a weird, it, that was a weird time for me. And all of a sudden I had no schedule for the first time in my life. So here is an excellent album. Dave Holland's Emerald Tears, like I said, recorded in August 1977. And like um, one I had, I had randomly selected not that long ago. Uh, no, it wasn't a random selection, I don't think, uh, when I did my uh, um, video on solo albums. Um, I had shown Gary, bassist Gary Peacock's album. I think that was also from 77. Uh, December Poems. And here Dave Holland is on upright bass as well. Uh, all solo. Love it. Um, he doesn't do all originals, interestingly enough. He does Solar by Miles Davis, version of that on bass, and an Anthony Braxton tune as well. Um, the rest of the tracks, the other six tracks, though, are originals. And, um, you know, to me, upright bass is always interesting. Uh, I think it's a hard sell for a lot of people. Understandably, it's not meant to be a solo instrument. Um, and I think you have to have a love. Uh, I just love the upright bass sound in general, especially when it's when it's recorded well. It's just such a, 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 a deep but natural woody sound. If it's recorded well, you can actually hear the wood on the upright bass. Um, or if you're lucky enough to be by one that's being played live. Um, I, you know, my, my first, now growing up, all I ever is Dave Holland. Um, growing up, my experience with upright bass didn't really happen much until I got into jazz because in rock music, there weren't a lot of upright basses at that point. And, you know, when I was into rock, even prog rock, I didn't really think about upright bass that much. But um, the very first ECM album I bought was Bar Phillips' Three Day Moon. And that was really the first time that I intentionally bought an album um, to hear the music. And there was an upright bass as lead instrument because Bar Phillips is an upright bass player. And that's when I really honed in on, on the differences, the sonic differences between electric bass and upright bass. And I really began to appreciate it. Now, I was lucky because I was also, that was an ECM record, so it was very well recorded. Uh, that was from about 1978. And um, you could really hear the, the quality of the bass. And then, of course, the added benefit with the upright bass that you don't have with the electric is you could bow it. So you create a whole nother world by being able to bow the thing. Um, and you know, hold out long sustained notes as long as, as as you want, and play in a violin type of technique, and you get that as well. So there's, um, and it took me a very short time to really fall in love with the sound of the upright bass. And I was playing music at the time as well um, with my buddy Frank who was an electric bass player and as we both got into the ECM world and of course upright bass players um, eventually I convinced him to go upright which was a big deal because when you're playing um, an electric bass with frets even a fretless electric bass um, it's very hard to go to an upright bass. It's kind of a different feel. Um, the neck is is bigger, is longer. Um, but I really wanted that sound in our music, and I kind of pushed for quite a while. And eventually, uh, and this is uh, this is pro this is around uh, like 1979 or 1980. Um, Eventually, he was looking in the newspaper, and we found an upright bass for sale uh, a few towns away. And it's it's funny sometimes how you remember things so vividly that aren't really maybe big events. It was a big event to me because we were finally getting an, uh, an upright bass into our music. But there was this guy several towns away who 
put an ad in the newspaper that he was selling, I guess, at a really reasonable price in upright base. And it turns out, uh, like I said, this was in 79 or 1980, right around there. And it turns out that um, it was basically sitting in this guy's attic. He had been a, I guess, maybe a semi-professional or part-time musician back in the day. And I guess this, you know, when you think about the time, the bass could have been sitting in his um, his attic for 20 years. So possibly at the time that he was a bass player, maybe electric basses didn't even exist. And he hadn't played for a number of years, but he kept the bass and he finally put it up for sale and Frank got this really nice bass. Um, and it, it, it had a really good natural sound to it. A um, lot, of, lot of sustain. And um, where we played was basically the basement of my house, which had very low ceilings. So the sound really stayed within those those walls. It didn't get lost in like a, a large empty room with high ceilings where the sound just dissipates. The sound really had nowhere to go. And that included everything, the guitars and drums and everything. Very low ceiling. And a small room, and the room had a lot of storage stuff in it, so the room was packed, so the sound really had nowhere to go. But I remember the bass sounded really good in that room. And there were times, he was much more into just playing for playing's sake th than I was. I was more of a, I play when I, you know, when we have to work on a piece or when I'm composing or, or, or recording, but I don't sit there and play for enjoyment, which he, which he did. So especially after he first got the bass and he was really working with it and learning it, um, he would sometimes sit there and play the, we, we'd practice our, whatever we were working on, pieces that we had written. And then when we were done with, with the practice, uh, if he had time and he didn't have to go off somewhere, he would just continue to play bass and I would just sit there and listen to it. And, um, and it had a great sound and I have great memories of, of, of that bass just being a solo bass. And... I never thought in terms, back then at that point, um, I didn't really think in terms of solo bass albums until I came across them. Now, roughly, I came across them roughly at that same time or slightly after that, that time. But because uh, because we had gotten into ECM Records. But I don't think we got the, the solo bass albums necessarily like that first year or so maybe we were into ECM. But of course, now when I... You know, when I see these and when I play these albums like this, Dave Holland, uh, Emerald Tears, and um, Gary Peacock's December Poems, um, Bar Phillips, the first journal violin album, which is just solo bass, it always makes me think of those little private concerts I had. I wish I would have, oh man, I wish I would have taped. Um, and at one point I did have, I did have, a snippet of one on tape, but the tape got lost uh, on a cassette tape. Um, but those little private concerts where he would just s stand there and play bass, and I would just sit on the old couch that was in the basement there, and I would just sit back and just listen to it. Um, that was really cool. I always, you know, when I listen to these solo bass albums, it always also takes me back to that time period. And here's another one that I thought I had pulled out before, but I guess not. Um, this, if I had thought of this album, when I did a couple videos ago, Charlie Bird, Brazilian Bird. This is an oldie. Uh, it's all, now Charlie Bird was a very big proponent of the music of Antonio Carlos Jobim. Now Charlie Bird is a nylon string guitarist. He plays kind of in a jazz and Latin context. Uh, but an American guy that fell in love with Brazilian Latin uh, bossa nova music back in the 1950s. Um, but oddly enough, Charlie Bird was the first place where I heard Antonio Carlos Jobim's music because just as I was getting out of rock and kind of expanding my horizons, Charlie Bird was one of the first jazz guys that I picked up an album by that wasn't an ECM album. Um, and he always, and it wasn't this particular one, but it was another one where he did like three out of eight tracks on the album were by Antonio Carlos Jobim. 
and that was really the first I'd heard of Jobim's recordings of his of his songs, with the exception of the girl from Ipanema, which I didn't even realize until later on that was uh, an Antonio Carlos Jobim song. And if you grew up in the '60s, you probably would have heard, you certainly in America, I think, would have heard the girl from Ipanema, and whether you knew who did it or not, or who wrote it. Now this was a later one. Now. Uh, just a couple videos ago, I did an easy listening um, video, and it was kind of done randomly. Had I really prepared for it, this would have been a prime example of easy listening music. Most people aren't going to like this album, even if they like the nylon string guitar played in a Brazilian jazz context, um, simply because this is very he heavy on string, brass, and woodwind arrangements. So, yeah, it does sound like elevator music. It's the kind of things that if you were around in the 60s and 70s and they played easy listening music in elevators that you heard, but I, I love this album. Yes, it sounds old, you know, when you put it on. I, you know, it doesn't say on here when it was recorded. Um, there's liner notes on here, but I, I don't see when it was recorded, but they, they do talk and make mention of Bird um, in 1961 and 62, and I don't see any mention of what he did after that, so my guess is that this is probably from shortly after that, maybe 63 or so, um, which would make sense. It sounds like it's from 63. Yes, it's very conservative. Uh, there's no long songs on here. There's no long improvisations. The longest song, and there's only one of there's only one of them this long, is three minutes and fifty two seconds. There's a lot of two minute songs on here and things under three minutes. Um, uh, but I, you know, I really love this. It, it's got. Uh, Yes, it's got a dated sound. Yes, it's mellow and relaxing and elevator music. The the arrangements are just fantastic, though. And if you if you do appreciate arrangements, um, if if you do enjoy listening to what strings and brass can do, um, it's just it's just really nice. Especially now, to me, they they create a nice backdrop uh, blanket, especially to. Um, nylon string guitar and it looks like um, Charlie Bird did do a couple of the actual arrangements on here uh, but Tom Newsom did most of them now I know Tom Newsom's name from somewhere else and I mean he played with the Benny Goodman band in the early days and, and other jazz people but I, um, I want to oh yeah I'm right it does mention it here um, now, at the time this was written, which I want to say is the early 60s, I thought he was the, um, he wrote arrangements and he played in the Tonight Show band during the Johnny Carson era. I knew I knew his name from somewhere, and, and that's, and I thought I thought he was tied in with the, with the Tonight Show. They called Tommy Newsom. Here he's credited as Tom Newsom, but when he was on the Tonight Show in the band and doing their arrangements, he was Tommy Newsom, and he would appear occasionally occasionally on um, on screen so um gee do i have this on cd I, I'm, I'm pretty sure i do i certainly hope i do and if i don't i certainly hope it's in print um but yeah a lot of people aren't going to like this um this would be a good album to play if i was out somewhere with my dad my dad would really appreciate this because that's that's his era and he's about 92 now um so if you have grandparents and you're looking for an album and you don't have anything in your collection besides metallica to, to to, to buy something to play around your grandparents, this this might be good. It's, it's a, it's it's really it's really pretty. If you can, uh, you know, when I first got it, yeah, yes, I was struck a bit by the because it was I think it was the second Charlie Bird album I bought, and the first one was just a live performance by a trio, no backing arrangements or strings or horns or anything. It was just a guitar, upright bass, and drums. So when I first put that on, it's like, oh yeah, gee, that sounds old, uh, but. You know, I was young then. I was 18 or 19 or something, I'm coming out of rock. Um, it so maybe it took me a, a while to appreciate. But that's the kind of stuff that increasingly 
I've really begun to appreciate and like now. And I'm always out of step with the times because now that stuff couldn't be less hip than than it ever was. People really don't make albums like that anymore. Uh, even if they do things, well, first of all, a lot of jazz musicians they don't even have that kind of heavily arranged things with strings and horns. Uh, it's just a whole different world now. So once again, I'm kind of out of step with what's current. Um, or, you know, the stuff that I hear that's current, I don't dig. Um, I guess now, in terms of what's, what's the equal to that kind of stuff now, would be like you know, R&B kind of very commercial uh, jazz with hip-hop kind of element types of things to it, I guess would be the thing that appeals to the young adults that would listen to that, or the say middle age, but you know, 30s adults maybe, um, not string and horn arrangements. So it's a it's it's a dying art and it's a shame because there's um, like like big bands really um, there's a lot that you can do there's a lot of open open freedom to to things that you could do with arrangements and all that and it's just not done anymore because number one it's not popular number two it's very expensive there's a lot of musicians that play on that album uh, that had to be paid and had to be paid um, uh, union wages. And then somebody had to write the charts, which was very time consuming uh, for every single instrument, all the strings, and all the horns. And um, so I, I think the record companies actually probably loved when that kind of music went out of favor because it meant that they could just record smaller bands quicker and, and without the expense um, that they had with these ultra arranged albums. But it's a shame I miss that stuff. And every once in a while I'll be watching a movie. Uh, from the 60s, especially the early 60s, and at some point in the movie, that kind of quote-unquote easy listening stuff at some point will be somewhere in the movie, and I stop paying attention to whatever the actors are saying or doing, and I just kind of hone in on the music. Um, so that, that was an interesting pick. I thought I had shown that album before. I love that album. Actually, I have pretty good, pretty good choice of albums here today. It covered a lot of ground, uh, solo upright bass, some kind of avant-garde ambient music and um, some easy listening that's that's a pretty wide range I'd say okay well this is longer than I intended on doing but um, I've got nothing but time right now it's still not quite 1 a.m. Um, so I am going to go I'm gonna keep this one under a half hour and which is incredible for me and um, hope everybody's doing well thanks for watching my videos and um, I'll be back very soon Tales from the Garage is brought to you by Monster Out. Just spray it once a day throughout your home and keeps all monsters away, even invisible ones. Say goodbye to ghoulies, goblins, gremlins, mummies, vampires, and the living dead. Not effective on witches, chicken men, or rhino girls. And by Smoky Brand Cigarettes. Nine out of ten doctors recommend smoky cigarettes to their patients. Remember, gals love a smoky man. Smoky, the key to great taste. Tune in next time for more Tales from the Garage.